Quesnos has one foot on the grave already. Since 2007, when they were at their peak, Quesnos has done nothing but decline, resulting in the store closings dropping from 4,700 locations to fewer than 260 locations, and angry franchisees who felt scammed and lost all their money. Quesnos did everything wrong, and it's not clear whether they ever will recover. So to get to the roots of all these problems, we need to understand what made Quesnos successful in the first place. In 1981, these two guys, Jimmy Lombados and Todd Disner, opened the first Quesnos in Denver. Together, they came up with the idea of opening a simple sandwich shop just a few blocks away from their Italian restaurant called Footers. So, using their knowledge of Italian food, they developed a simple menu for Quesnos, offering submarine sandwiches, salads, pasta, and a few Italian dishes. For their sandwich, they used fresh baked soft baguette and quality meats. And before adding lettuce, tomatoes, and red onions, they oven toasted the sandwich to melt the cheese and give the bread a nice crunch. It was fresh, cheap, and healthy. The model drew a lot of customers and ended up being so successful that Lobatos and Disner began franchising. Over the next decade, 16 more locations were open, with each restaurant averaging about $27,000 per month in sales. However, Lobatos and Disner faced a hard challenge. Maintaining the same quality from store to store was almost impossible. They also didn't have enough money to provide managerial and advertising support to franchisees. That's when they sold the company in 1991 to one of the franchisees, Rich Schotten, who owned four Quesnos with his father, named also Rick Schotten. The acquisition marked the start of a new era that promised growth, but also set off a complex saga of disputes and legal battles. By 1995, the Schottens expanded the chain from 18 to 103 locations, painting a clear picture of their exponential growth, and by 1997, Quesnos established itself as the third biggest submarine sandwich chain in the world, boasting 278 locations in the United States, Puerto Rico, and Canada. But this is nothing compared to what's to come. By the year 2000, Quesnos celebrated by opening its 1,000th store and recorded corporate revenues of $41.9 million. Things look great. Quesno's popularity soared. The chain rapidly expanded both domestically and internationally, riding the wave of its toasted sandwich concept. But as you know, this wouldn't last, because the mid-2000s have not been kind to Quesno's. Things have taken a turn for the worse. Shun's desire for growth led them to make an awful decision that made Quesno's what it is today. The Shottens formed American Food Distributors, a holding company through which franchisees were required to purchase all their supplies, the meat and cheese for the sandwich, the soaps for the bathrooms, and even for the payroll and accounting system. This setup became a double-edged sword. While intending to streamline operations and ensure consistency, it imposed heavy financial hardships on franchisees due to marked up prices on everything, from ingredients to store essentials, and it required franchisees to achieve much higher sales to reach profitability. The strain of rent, franchise fees, utility, labor costs, and these exorbitant food costs turned many franchises into sinking ships, and the Shottens were just watching them struggling and never offered them necessary support. Well, because in peak years, it was reported that the American food distributors made Quesnos about $200 million in revenue, way more than they could earn with royalties. And all the earnings gained from this enabled even greater expansion. Because from 2002 to 2004, Quesnos exploded from 1,700 locations to 3,300 locations. Franchisees started expressing their concerns, sparking a series of lawsuits against Quesnos, accusing the company of making them captive customers to its overpriced supplies. The settlement of these lawsuits cost Quesnos over $300 million, a testament to the severity of the disputes. Adding to the turmoil, numerous franchisees faced disputes over location agreements, paying fees without being able to open their own stores. Tragically, the intense pressure and financial strain led to dire consequences for some store franchisees. As a single example, Fupender Bobber was a franchisee who owned two Quesno stores in Long Beach. His sales took another hit when another Quesnos opened nearby. He reached out to Quesnos corporate, hoping that they would keep their promise and not allow competition in the area. 
Unfortunately, they didn't listen. In 2004, feeling the need to take action, Bobbers started the Quesnos Franchisees Association to unite owners against what they saw as unfair business practices. In the same year, Quesnos ended Bobbers' franchise agreement, leaving him in turmoil. By 2005, he was supposed to go to Denver to argue his case against Quesnos. Overwhelmed by the financial stress and fearing he'd lose everything, he tragically ended his life, walking into a Quesnos bathroom in LA and shooting himself three times in the chest. Bobber left behind a note, citing his frustrations and pleading for an investigation into Quesnos and their business practices. He spoke of being dragged through the legal system and regretted ever hearing of Quesnos. This tragic incident played a significant role in the ongoing legal battles between Quesnos and the franchisees. During this period, Subway was rising thanks to their most successful ad campaign, featuring Jared Fogel, also known as the Subway Guy. Even though Jared's actions had a significant negative impact on the Subway brand later, but awareness of the brand was created. But not so much with Quesnos's Sponge Monkey campaign, which Business Insider labeled it as one of the top 10 worst ad campaigns of all time. Once 2006 rolled around, Quesnos tried to hold its own against Subway. They sold 49% of the company to a private equity firm called CCMP Capital Advisors, hoping to sprinkle some magic and turn things around. But instead of magic, the acquisition left Quesnos with hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. This event was the beginning of Quesnos' massive decline. Even though they hit their peak at 4,700 locations in 2007, the Great Recession of 2008 came crashing through, and it was like a wrecking ball. The economic downturn, combined with the years of corporate mismanagement, saw Quesnos left in shambles, closing over 2,000 stores between 2008 and 2012. The trouble peaked in 2014, when Quesnos waved the white flag, filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, revealing staggering debts of over $500 million. On December 1st of 2015, Quesnos opened a concept restaurant called Quesnos Grill, hoping to rebrand its products and increase menu offerings. Initial review of this restaurant highlighted the high price once items were added to the sandwich, and that's why the Quesnos Grill concept was abandoned in late 2016. In 2018, High Bluff Capital Partners, a private investment firm, took the reins of Quesnos. The idea was to inject some new energy and sign an exclusive development agreement to construct Quesnos' new stores across Denver. But as we would know, the road to recovery can be full of bumps and twists. The ongoing store closures and overall decline in the brand's presence didn't help either. From a high of around 4,700 units in 2007, the numbers dwindled significantly to just 251 stores in 2024. Shadon's hunger for quick growth and bad decisions to take advantage of franchisees led Quesnos to this sad and deserved end. And in my opinion, Quesnos won't exist in a few years. Now, if you enjoyed this video so far, then make sure to give a cheesy push to that like button. Thank you, and see you in the next video.